Hello and welcome to The Current Thing with me, Nick Dixon. We are back with another topical episode. You can get the full episode as ever at nickdixon.net. It's only five quid a month. You get all my extra stuff, nickdixon.net. I highly recommend it, as I would, of course. And we have our old <laughs> friend back again today. It is, of course, Mr. Paul Cox, star of GB News and many other things. How are you doing, Paul? I'm good, thank you, Nick. How are you, mate? I'm all right, mate. I'm, I'm psyched to do another episode with you. People loved our last one. Many yeah. people... I mean, it really many was people. many people. The feedback was incredible. I think it was the most paid subscribers I've ever had on my website. And Wonderful. the feedback was just incredible. And so I've got you back to kind of just exploit and drain you, just drain the talent <laughs> from you. Milk this cow. Milk, milk this. Milk, milk I don't this. know if you can milk a pig. You might be able to milk a pig. Oh, yeah, because you're the that. people's gammon. You've even got the pig in the background. Yeah, I know. Very on brand. I love it. Yeah. People's gammon. Me. Milking the people's gammon. Milking a pig is a grim image, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, attempting to without knowing if it's going to work is a grim image. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? That's actually highly relevant to our first topic, Paul. Maybe we should get into it because that's yeah. so relevant because we're talking about the Farmers' March, which is kicking off as we speak. And of course, wow. we are recording on the day of the march. So by the time you listen to it, who knows what the details will be. So far, there's just been some absolute bangers. There's been um, uh, Jeremy Clarkson rising up and being the hero that Britain needs, doing a great speech where he's, he was talking about how it's so impossible for farmers, there's all these regulations, and then prices go up, then the consumer complains and says, well, I can get my chicken elsewhere. And he's like, yeah, you can if you want it so chlorinated. It's, it tastes like a swimming pool with a beak, which is probably the best <laughs> line. But he was sticking it to Rachel Thieves and uh, Keir Stalin. And uh, I'm, just, I'm turning into Dan Wood. <laughs> Rachel Thieves and Keir Stalin. We love Dan, but I just love the way he always brings in the names. He never forgets that. That's why he's a pro. And they stick forget. as well. They, they stick. stick every time. That's all I can think about. When I'm talking about it, I can only think of the way Dan Wood would describe them. Yeah. She's probably got on her CV, to be honest, Rachel Thieves, that she was a farmer for <laughs> the best part of a decade. Yeah. That is amazing. I mean, we haven't, we haven't even talked about that story. The fact that no. the Chancellor, the first female Chancellor... I'll have you know, has broken the glass ceiling, but she's also lied on her CV. Allegedly, some people think satirically, according to some people. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, just off comm train there. And, um, <laughs> We're and on she, the telly, Nick. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. She allegedly lied and said that she was an economist and then she changed it on LinkedIn because it was she actually had some sort of administrative job. Listen, I know people that work at the Bank of England, for example, your job is very rarely economist. It's something yeah. usually way more specific, right? There aren't many jobs. <laughs> economist, it's like... I think you've made that up. Like it's like <laughs> yeah. it's just a child's idea of it's like what do you want to be when you grow up? You, you know, economist. Like yeah, okay, but that's a bit broad, mate. Can you narrow it down? Well, no, I mate. <laughs> but if you're the chancellor, is it likely that you? And it said that she probably wasn't. How serious is that? I mean, some people say that's illegal. Well, she. Okay, how serious is it? In isolation, not entirely serious. Perhaps we've all told a few porkies on our CV. However, we're not all Chancellor of the Exchequer. And it's not just in isolation, though, is it? I mean, she she wrote a book uh, last year, which I haven't read, so I don't know the title of, where she plagiarised large amounts of it um, from Wikipedia and Guardian articles. Uh, and she's consistently said um, that she's worked in... As an economist, Fisher Price, an entry level economist, uh, you know, she got it for a, she got it from Argos one year. Got her mum to buy it in the uh, in the catalogue and said, "This is what I want to be." So she put that on her CV. Uh, look, I mean, she's the chance of the exchequer. She's there to be taking a pop at, and if if she's going to be editing a, a LinkedIn in real time, as she did just recently, then people like Guy Forks are going to scrutinise it and go, "Hang on a minute." Yeah. Uh, yeah, what's the truth? Guido Fawkes wrote the story. Um, Guido Fawkes. Yes, Guido, yeah, and and yeah, very. I mean, it's not got that much attention. It's got a bit of attention because there's so many corrupt things with this Labour government that you don't even you don't know. By the way, when you said telling porkies, I suddenly thought great name for Paul's podcast. Yeah. People's gammon. You got a pig in the background. Telling porkies. What kind of telling porkies with poor cock? I mean, I don't know. The theme of the show is just you lying. That's the only problem. <laughs> well, we just get to the end and you have to guess what was the truth. Do you know what? That was a serious suggestion, a suggestion I tried to suggest on The Weekly Skeptic. And Toby ruled it out because he's autistic and said, well, if we do that, won't well, people just think we've been lying in the whole time and it'll compromise our integrity? It's like, okay, Toby, let's have no fun. How about that? No fun. <laughs> also, ever. Toby has got integrity. I've got very little. So what I can do is, uh, I love the idea of telling porkies. Telling Porky's mate, I gave you the people's gammon, effectively. I said the people, what yeah, did I say? Did. The thinking man's gammon. And it was a short step leap from there. And uh, and uh, to be fair, I've given you everything. 
Really? And uh, I made you. All, all I made opportunities you. have been provided by Nick Dixon. <laughs> yeah. You are nothing. And I <laughs> am Alan Partridge. Um, so, yeah, people's gammon, telling porkies with the people's gammon. And what my idea was, and you can maybe just have this, is there's one lie. And maybe I shouldn't give you this, but I'll, we can we can, can produce it, this. Nick. You can take uh, all the money. Yeah, I could take a cut. Because what my idea was going to be, there's one lie in the show. And you have to listen to the whole show and find out what it was. And that proves who's listened. And it's like a game where people get a, a prize if they, what was the one lie in the show? See what I mean? And it, it would be something quite silly, but you'd just check if they'd listen. But this was ruled out by the fun police. But that's a pretty good idea anyway. Um, and by the way, we're doing it on Zoom again, this recording, just so if anyone complains about the recording, we're not doing it on Riverside as normal because someone, doesn't matter who, can't work the technology. So, uh, <laughs> um, sorry, Paul. Um, maybe that was the porky we don't know um so this farmer's march clarkson he got he got grilled by victoria derbyshire very sort of classic bbc and he just interrupted said a classic bbc question because they were just trying to grill him about his his inheritance tax and all this kind of stuff it was really route one bbc stuff and he just said they'd become in his speech he said they'd become the mouthpiece of this what did he say appalling government he didn't say appalling he said something even worse than that didn't he miserable i can't remember the word he used now but he said they'd become the mouthpiece of the government What's your overall take on it, Paul, on the farmers rising up? Are you? Do you think they, they are right? And what do you think they'll do next? Clarkson said they won't strike, but he has a couple of ideas. Yeah, I'm incredibly supportive of the farmers. Um, I think the farmers were getting a rough deal prior to the budget, to be fair. But now with uh, the budget, you know, dictating that essentially anyone with a farm worth more than a million quid, so all, all farms, um, I can't really afford to pass it on because they got absolutely slammed for inheritance tax. It's essentially uh, what it creates is a massive unknown. And that's what happens to the farming industry in the UK over the next 25 to 50 years. Because anyone who's in, in farming at the moment um, who who is just about making ends meet, which I'm sure is the large majority of them, is going to find it very difficult to pass the farm on. So how do they plan for the future? What happens to that land in the future? Um, we haven't got enough farming as it is now, would be my uh, opinion. Uh, we, we, we we don't have a great deal of food sovereignty. Um, so we need, we need to be planning for the future. And the future now looks really up in the air because who's going to do the farming? And what... so. What I look at, um, I try and sort of, you know, there's a lot of chaff in the wheat when it gets very political and it gets very opinionated. But one thing that Labour Party has done ever since this budget, particularly on the farming issue and and killing old people, which seems to be a, another a firm favourite of theirs, indirectly, of course, not directly. That's not an actual policy. Although you mean the winter fuel allowance or the winter, uh, winter assisted dying allowance. because they want to kill them in various ways? Yeah, so we're going to have no land and no old people. Um, so I don't know what the plan is, um, but with all those dead people, we need land to bury them in, Nick. So uh, I don't know if that's a, perhaps we just become a nation of uh, graveyards. I don't know how it works out. But anyway, they are religiously, and I mean this, religiously attached to the idea of the things that they put in this budget. They're not going to budge whatsoever. So therefore, if it's baked in so hard as that, we need to understand why. It's not just about, it doesn't generate enough None of these things generate enough income to say, look, OK, it isn't great, but look at this income. It's, it, it, it's amazing. Like the Elvis films. I just watched the Netflix recently. He had a five-year deal where he made the worst movies of all time but got paid so much money that he kept on doing it in the end to his own detriment. Why are the Labour government so hell-bent on making sure they follow through with this particular inheritance tax for farmers i don't know so there's a bunch of really big unanswered questions for me why are they doing it and what's the plan for the future would be the first two things i'd want to know because it can't be farming unless it's going to turn them all into some solar farm or i don't know, build housing build affordable housing for the boat men yeah but well well one thing is the solar isn't it so there was this phone call into james o'brien which was pretty hilarious and a farmer calls up and and it gets very heated and and james o'brien says this extraordinary thing he goes well, why can't you sell some stuff like, oh thanks mate thanks radio man you you want me to i've got to sell things now you what a piece of shit i mean the idea of telling a farmer to sell some stuff because the inheritance tax is screwing him and he says look we've had the offer he says who's going to buy it a farmer's not going to buy it it's going to be someone who's going to make put so, uh, solar there like you say and then james like what's wrong with that 
He just doesn't get it, does he? He just, he just wants Solar and Windfall. Then it's not a fucking farm, is it? He just wants Solar. Someone told me off for swearing last time. I just delete those <laughs> comments. Uh, yeah, yeah, just, sh just shut up. It's my Very podcast. Very naughty, Nick, but, swearing. Um, yeah, it's just like, there's always someone. Um, solar and wind farms, like, that's, that's not what we want, though, is it? We want actual farms, James, but you don't get that. And the guy just shouts at me. He goes, and James went, listen, mate. He goes, I'm not your mate. I hate you. I think you're an idiot. <laughs> it was so good. Um, it was glorious. Someone's going to tell him. And by the way, infernal government was what Clarkson said. He said uh, this, the oh, BBC has become the mouthpiece for this infernal government. Well, I can give you one answer, Paul. I mean, there's all the details. There's the, the way they've screwed over the farmers and they want, they don't care. As that former advisor revealed the mindset, they don't care about small farms at all. He said, why do we even need these small farms? They basically want it all to just be big corporations. And that's what's going to happen. So it's kind of corporatist. They're sort of communists, but they're this new kind of sort of communist who just wants big companies who are sort of quasi private and quasi public and this is kind of where it's going and yeah, I just interestingly think... sorry oh. nick interestingly when we use um i've been criticized just recently for using the term communist to describe anything associated with the labor government and people think it's just too big an exaggeration and most of those people believe that right up until the point it's happening or about 10 minutes after it's happened and i mean how many more red flags do you want that they want control of people they want control of land. Now, of course, you know, we're not going to turn... The UK isn't just going to turn into some uh, communist paradise overnight. Um, but the policies are straight from, are straight from Marx. It's, 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 it's undeniable. You've only got to... Re just read the book is all I would say. You know, let's not yeah. go into it here. Well, you've said that. You've been criticised. Probably that's because the people criticising you voted Labour and felt embarrassed. But... It's it's um it's reasonable to at least in a semi satirical way say that this is like what Stalin did to the Kulaks because these are the most hated people the people that build up a bit of wealth for themselves they're a threat to the state they they represent a kind of what some people call it a sort of um, a rival castle you know in in the past the state had a lot less power because you had the king but then you had these sort of smaller sort of barons or whatever it was these feudal lords yeah you, you had the church. You had multiple competing castles in society, and then that's all been stripped away. Oren McIntyre is very good on this in the, in the total state. That's all been stripped away for one monolith, the top-down state, which everything is a, a branch of. This is what, we didn't used to have this in the past. The king had to be a bit careful that he didn't piss off these rival factions, and now we don't have that. So farmers are one of the last holdouts. That's why I call it the Shire. They are one of the last holdouts of the old England. And I call it farmers versus starmers, which is catchy, but it's also, to me shows the perfect divide. The farmer, he he is an example of what I call the Scrutonian primacy of place, if you will, which is, you know, based on Roger Scruton, you, you're, you are a product of your land, your family, the uh, oikos, as he calls it. Everything mm. comes out in concentric circles from there. So you, there's no one more tied to the land, clearly, than a farmer. He's tied to the land for generations so he's a kind of de facto nationalist because he's he's a de facto rural person he's yeah. a traditional person and then he's a national person the starmer man who, who is the anywhere man the davos man he actually said davos over westminster famously he's Incredible. the exact opposite he's the dispossessed citizen of anywhere who wants everyone to just be atomized individuals ostensibly with sort of ultimate choice and no responsibilities but in fact tied to the total state rather than tied to these smaller communities uh, where you have bonds and obligations. And st so isn't it, isn't it a base, aside from all the budget and the tax and all that, isn't it at its root an ideological clash? And not even an ideological, this is just one more point on that, not a clash really between two ideologies, but in a way between ideology and non-ideology, which is the organic non-ideology of the farmer, which is just, you can't really call it an ideology because it's not top down, it's not rationalistic, it's, just what what has developed organically and conservatism is all about protecting that and the left is all about destroying that yeah it's a clash between power and people the classic clash where uh, and by the way i mean i don't think it's unfair to say that the vast majority of labor mps don't know anything about the countryside let alone farming i think the agricultural minister is famous from, for coming from lambeth which is not famous for farms uh, in the last uh, millennia. I mean, I, I think it was. A, I think it had some pretty big farms uh, previous to the eleventh century, but since then it's been uh, it's it's been it's been growing somewhat, <laughs> and uh, has become this conurbation. 
and there's now known as London. But those so, 11th century Lambeth farms, they were just cranking out the milk. Oh man, that was the best yeah. milk. <laughs> they were, they were milking oh. pigs, everything. <laughs> pig cheese, some of the best pig cheese I've ever had Dick, for the 11th century Lambeth farming community. <laughs> but I mean, where, where this is what this is what strikes me. I start to look at stuff like this. Where does it come from? Is there? Am I being naive? Are they being naive? Who's being naive here? What What's the end goal? The end goal seems to be uh, we're just going to get some money to fill a black hole. A black hole, by the way, that the by the way that the OBR doesn't support. The OBR can't find anything more than about nine and a half billion. I'm not saying that's not a lot of money, but it's not the twenty two. It's not the forty. It's not the X number that Rachel Reeves has talked about previously. By the way, the reason I mentioned that is because it underpins absolutely everything they've done since they got into power. The f in week one, she sat down and went, there's this black hole. And then everything, absolutely everything subsequent to that has been based on that black hole. Now, if we can't substantiate the black hole using statistics from the OBR, then doesn't it just undermine absolutely everything they've done since? Perhaps another question. But the black hole is kind of their Pearl Harbor or 9-11. It's like, right, but the budget version of that, it's like, right, now we're going nuclear on you because of this black hole. It's just their excuse to do anything. It's like domestic violence, isn't it? You know, they're, they're smacking us around the face, look, saying, look at what you've made me done. I can't believe you've made me this angry. Look what the Tories made me do with their black hole. Yeah. You've made me destroy the farmers. I didn't want to do this. Yeah, it's your fault. It's your fault. Um, and of course, look, we have to try and step back sometimes and look at this and go, OK, uh, the economy, um, let's just take on face value what Labour say, the economy's not great. I don't necessarily agree with that. The economy's getting worse. Growth is certainly getting worse since Labour have got in. Astonishingly, they've managed to take it down from where the Tories left it. But anyway, let's park that to one side. We have, let's, let's take on face value that the economy's bad. So they're trying to improve the economy and they need to inject money into the economy. But the, the things they've the things they've attacked so far are all the key things they've attacked so far to try and get it. A farming, the one thing that we can all get behind, and old people, the other thing we can all get behind. Ludicrously, look, I say this over and over and over again. Ten billion pound a year goes on net zero. Net zero cannot be achieved, but ten billion pound a year gets spent on it. Ten billion pound a year fixes the NHS. Done wallop you can carry on overspending as much as you like on the nhs with 10 billion pound a year what, what you can also do very quickly within two years is fill an imaginary black hole just cancel net zero just say we're doing our best we're doing our recycling we'll catch up in a couple of years when our economy's better nobody's actually nobody's actually actively trying to ruin the climate and by the way our, our contribution to the let's if we hit net zero, our contribution is the square root of fuck all. I'd like to apologise on behalf of the people that, that get offended by the word <laughs> fuck and all. Um, but I just don't understand. I just don't understand, you know, what, where's the method in the madness? Where does it, it's, not some sort of, it's not some sort of 4D chess where, oh, I don't get it yet, I don't get it yet. Oh, and then the penny drops. And all of a sudden, oh, yeah, the best people to go after are the old people and the farmers. I don't, that's never going to happen, by the way. And I still don't understand why they're doing it. Why is this the ditch they're dying in? And I think it's that one of the reasons it's the ditch they're dying is dying in is farmers don't vote Labour because Labour don't understand farming. Old people don't vote Labour because the Conservatives look after old people and so on and so forth. So they're essentially attacking the people that don't look after them to create some sort of utopia in the future that none of us understand at the moment, but looks quite terrifying. Yeah, sorry. So there's so much there. I mean, you're right. The Tories do it because it's not their people. Under Labour, the NHS was on well, strike and teachers, but of course under Tories, uh, the farmers are. They're, they're not their people. They're not their voters. So it's it's very simple in, in that sense. And when you say old people is something we can all get behind and farms and of course obviously it's not as we're finding that reminded me there's nothing these people won't justify an attempt to justify we've seen it with the Alison Pearson story which we'll get on to but the when the left have just decided something they will just use sophistry to justify anything so we've seen Kevin Maguire here Salman must win the fight with tax dodging landowners so he characterizes the farmers as tax dodging landowners. Isn't that absolutely despicable? These are people who are just subsisting, basically, trying to pass on a farm for generations and make a small profit to, to survive as they go. Terry Christian was the other one. He was like, poor bloke, farm worth 12 million quid and so will pay 600,000 inheritance tax, but can do it over 10 years. Imagine how we'd struggle inheriting 11.4 million quid 
should do a GoFundMe page. I don't know how I'll sleep worrying about paying them a share, fair share, 40% of everything. I mean, the idea that 40% is, is a fair tax is absurd anyway. But, and even Tim Farron, normally a lefty, wimp on most issues, wrote in the lakes, which is where I'm from, listeners, in the lakes, you can have a farm worth millions on paper and earn less than the minimum wage. If you have to sell it to pay IHT, the farm will go into the hands of massive corporate types. This reduces food production, harms the environment, and is simply unjust. And Tim gets it because he is an MP in the lakes and has been for years. And yeah. so he gets it on that issue. And it doesn't it just prove Robert Conquest's first law that that uh, people are conservative about what they know best. So often Tim Farron comes out with wet lefty takes. You go, why is he such an idiot? But on this, because he actually knows about it, because he, he's in a rural community, he gets it. There was another lefty that said, "I don't." some just lefty tweet person with a rainbow flag, I don't even know what they're protesting in favor of, but they're farmers, so it's almost certainly a bad thing. It's like, do you think you've, do you think you've jumped the shark when you come out against food? Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how, you, well, how do they arrive at that, by the way? I mean, how is that even? That's not even okay. You could say that you, you, there are groups that you could say that against, and perhaps I'm even in some of those groups. But farmers, it's so tribal. It's just like farmers bad now. You know, journalists should be investigated by police in the Alison Pearson case. But there's no position they won't take, however perverse, for their side. You know, and this, their new. So, oh, we we hate farmers now. Cool. Give me the notes. Oh, they're landowners. Oh, they're scum. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. It's like. What is wrong with you people? You... Yeah, and and the, the the attacking Clarkson thing is is very typical of the left as well. They'll take an example like Clarkson and say, "Look, this is an example of all farmers. This is why we're doing it." It's not true at all. It's the same with their tax system. We've got oh, we're going after the very wealthy here by taxing to death the people who earn forty grand a year. You're like, what are you talking about, you knob? None of it makes sense. The, 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 the connection between Jeremy Clarkson and his standard farmers is quite a long one, OK? Now, he is just, he is a voice, and unfortunately he is a voice because he's got into farming because he can afford to. And he's finding how incredibly expensive it is and how small the profits are. And because he's found that out, he's speaking up for them and they're attacking one aspect of him and that, that, he's, that's, that he is wealthy, OK? So they do this with absolutely everybody. Anybody who's got an element of success behind them or beyond the line of success they'd like them to travel, they will attack them. So everybody has to stay as one community. They have to. They can't go any further than here. You, you, you need to bring people up to this point and then they must stay there. So anybody who achieves anything is frowned upon. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. this case, it's um, farmers. Well, yeah, you they, on... believe, they believe that yeah, they're asset rich. Let's say they've got a two million pound farm. That doesn't. That only generates them the money that they can get from farming, and farming generates them very little because they are getting squashed down by huge supermarkets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, which means their profit margins are tiny and have to produce more and more and more. And they're competing with you know swimming pool chickens or America or whatever it is because they can do more because they got much more land and can do much more for their money. So mm. we're saying what was these are the very people who say oh we only buy. Um, free range chickens, free range eggs. I want I want my cows to be looked after and masturbated twice a week or whatever. But if in order to get that, you've got to look after the people that you now dislike. It's just this circle of nonsense. Yeah. You're right, and you're right about the obsession with equality, of course. The differences with the right, although we never see a right there's no right wing parties, so we never see this, but is it is the acceptance of inequality as a condition of freedom. But you never see that. The left, of course, is obsessed with equality, as you hint there. And by the way, on that note, when people say to you that it's so foolish that you call them communists on the telly, you could at least call them social. I mean, one, China's not communist in the old sense anymore either. It's That's something different as well. It's it's whatever it is. But Bannon sometimes calls it mercantile. It's it, you know, it's a strange mixture of things. It's sort of authoritarian capitalism, whatever you want to call it. But and th I think it is a reasonable thing to compare Labour to China because that's the kind of thing they seem to want. But you could also point out that Starmer was editor of Socialist Alternatives and, as Peter Hitchens has pointed out many times, is a Pabloite, which is a subset of Trotskyism. So they are lefties. And I think some people, not me, but some people have been shocked by just how openly socialist and ideological the budget was and Labour are. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, no. they, 
they're the Labour Party. They're born from socialism. They're born from the trade unions. I'm not surprised by that. I'm not offended by it either. You know, the Tories were kicked out. Labour came in. Uh, if you are if you are entirely surprised by the connection uh, between Labour and socialism, then I'm more for you, particularly if you voted for Labour. And you know, I think you should. This is socialism is the sort of thing you should grow out of, like yeah. nappies. But, but, but the difference is, and it, maybe people can put this better than me because I'm just thinking about it, but the Labour is now the party of high income people, right? So we saw those charts around the time of the election. If you're on 70 grand a year or more, you're more likely to vote Labour. The more it goes down, the more likely you are to vote Reform. If you're under 20,000 pounds, they're the most likely to vote Reform. So that's so it's not the, the, the working class man, is it? It's the, and the unions now, you know, you do pretty well. You're, in, you're driving a train and getting paid quite well. So what is it? It's supporting a particular class of people. They're not the working class, clearly. They're a kind of, what, public, the public sector middle class? Yeah, and, but, but, not, but not all of them. You and I could fall into that bracket, Nick. Many people we know could fall into that bracket. But you, has to, you still have to think the right way. You might earn enough, but you still have to think the right way. It's the centrist dads, isn't it? It's the North, it's the North London intelligentsia. It's it's those that aren't affected by the things that we talk about, uh, yeah. that will, will proudly parade themselves as people on the right side of history. It, you're right. Um, it's kind of a sensibility because in recent times I've done better financially, finally in my life for now. So I could be a Labour voter, but um, sensibility wise, I'll always not because I'm part of from the north, from a village, from you know where lots of people are farmers. So I'd always naturally back the farmers. I've been unemployed. I've been poor, you know, I've had mo no money most of my life. I've lived in the North for the first 20 odd years of my life, then in London. So I'll never kind of, I'll always kind of by sensibility be a Northern person. My granddad was very proud of being working class. My dad, less proud of it, but grew up working class, but he was more trying to get out of it. But I'll always, those, that'll, be, that'll be my sensibility. But it doesn't, doesn't necessarily go that way because, you know, my brother's gone completely the other way. He's, he's part of the deep state. So... It's a sort of sensibility thing, isn't it? I mean, you, you, I suppose you could have gone either way. You could have gone into the left. I was a, I was a Labour voter uh, as an adult all the way through till I'm four. Actually, I'm 45 next week. So all the way until I was about 40 almost, I was a Labour voter. Essentially, what woke me up was Corbynism and realising how close to the leadership of Labour Corbynism was and thought, oh, hang on a minute, I can't align myself with this stuff whatsoever. Nothing of this appeals to me i can't find anything endearing about it in fact some of it feels dangerous mm. genuinely felt dangerous to me uh danger danger to the protection of our country above all else i'm someone who grew up in portsmouth an affinity to the navy our defense and because of that i really struggle to understand uh the corbynite hatred of all things defence of the UK, in a sense that we should militarily just open up our borders. Everyone should just be friends. We don't need any. We don't need uh, any prevention systems. All, all we need is, you know, is hugging and uh, slippers made of piss or whatever they like. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> slippers made of piss. Well, that's the, the episode title sorted. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm amazed that you were you were lefty till Corbyn. I mean, that's a very recent well, red pilling. Tony Blair was the first guy I voted for. And, you know, as, as someone from a working class background, growing up in a relatively working class area at the time, then the Tories didn't speak to me. The Tories of the 80s didn't speak to me very well. I mean, looking back, um, there were some things that we can all be proud of that Thatcher did in terms of defending our country in the Falklands War. Uh, there are some things that we can look at uh, that the Tories and Thatcher did in the 80s that we can be much less proud of, I'm sure. Uh, however, so when I became sort of of age in 1997 and could vote, it just coincided with Tony Blair and it felt, it felt bright. And, and I would say the years between 97 and 2001 before the Trade Centres were hit, trade, uh, uh, the Twin Towers were hit, the Trade Centre were hit, um, everything felt kind of rosy in the world. Uh, I, I'm of an age that I'd started working by that point and the company I was working for, there was substantial pay rises every year. The economy was booming. Everything felt slight, a lot more affordable than it did now. I bought my first house in that period because I bought my first house as sort of a 20-year-old um, 
and I bought a two bedroom house on a relatively nice new build housing estate for like 78,000 quid. I mean, 78,000 quid now is like a month's rent in where you live, Nick. Yeah. So, yeah. have you got, can you give me some money? Um, you're the problem, Paul. You bought early. Yeah, I did. Old I am land. the problem. You're, you're a landlord, slumlord, probably. Yeah, I, out yeah. Houses. I, I... <laughs> Well, only six children in my uh, in my properties have died, Nick. I don't know. Why. You can't really accuse me of being a slum landlord. No, it just came into my head because there used to be a comedy promoter who actually was running like a warehouse, and I was like, "You're you're an actual slum lord, aren't you?" And he, he he actually just was. Uh, so it just popped into my head. But uh, obviously, not obviously you're not a slum lord. You've got a nice garden. You bought early. You did well, and you know you cracked you cracked on and, and worked hard and did it earlier. Wish I was that smart. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, now it's interesting. Your your labour. Can I just get back quickly to the farmer thing and ask what, finally on that topic, what um, you think they'll do next? There was a very funny video on Sky News where they, where they talked about farmers' marches and the, the video they started playing was like missiles launching off somewhere. I can't remember where, where but it was like, I was like, oh, they've gone further than even I thought they would. But um, they will rise up. It, it, I said they'd rise up and it would be like the Ents. I said a few weeks ago it would be like the Ents in Lord of the Rings when they smash the walls and, and, and the last march of the Ents. But what do you think it will be? Because... Clarkson has hinted there it won't be just strikes. Another man said it will do it more like the French. Presumably it doesn't mean smoking thin cigarettes and uh, eating yeah. cheese. Well, Taking the afternoon off. Quite a lot of cheese. Taking the afternoon off, being rude and being promiscuous. I don't think he means that, but um, what do you think they'll do? Well, it'll be interesting. I, I was on uh, Headliners on Sunday evening and I, I specifically said I hope they don't strike in the same way as I was against... The NHS workers, frontline NHS workers striking, I see them as an emergency service, essentially. Um, we need the NHS and we need farmers. So I'm hoping that they don't because it affects absolutely everybody. And really, this isn't everybody's fault. Uh, this is uh, the fault of a, a, a government that, by its very nature, only knows one method of government, and that is overreach. So, you know, that's all they can do. But, yeah. you know, they get to the point where it's reach, and they think, well, that's not far enough. And they overreach on absolutely yeah, everything. Reach around. It feels, yeah, the, the government pockets. of reach around. Especially which, for uh, a farmer. Yeah. Not, uh, <laughs> I, but, you know, the, the question Rachel you Rachel Reeves, me, Paul, having a reach around into your pocket, how would you feel? Well. I've turned into Mark know. Dolan. Conflicted. Rachel Reeves, Paul, <laughs> having a reach around, how would you feel? Quick thoughts with the cock like, against us. Yeah, that's the Rachel sort of thing Reeves. Mark would ask you live on air, and you've got to give him an answer immediately. And I'm still so conflicted. Um, you know, I'm still, I'm still a man, Nick. You know, I still right. have needs. You're still a man. If it's a reach around, you can't see what she looks like, so that's kind of negated. That well, cool? you know what? I don't, I, I don't think her appearance matters, Nick. Right. It's more but about just you, you'll take anything. The softness of her skin. <laughs> oh, it's the, oh, it's the softness of her skin. You can think about anything. Yeah, you can. you can. I've got a great got, imagination. You've got all those right? Sydney, Sweet, Sydney Sweeney videos in your mind. <laughs> I, I'm lost now in this kind of haze. There's kind of sweet guitar music playing uh, and uh, somebody's whispering in my ear. But let's not talk about that right now. But it's Rachel Reeves and she's where saying, do we, where, I want your the, farm. <laughs> oh my God. Rachel Reeves milks a pig. This happens to be Paul Cox. <laughs> Somebody AI that. Please. Yeah, I was going to say, this is like the podcast equivalent of AI. It's just random yeah. images. People are going, what are they talking about? It's just random generation <laughs> just of images. that bit. Makes no sense whatsoever. It never will. But where no. do we end up? I don't know. Because yeah. they're not going to back down. They're not going to back down on their, their budget policies. They're going to continue with that come what may. And uh, neither are the farmers. So, uh, you know, they're just going to... Maybe the, maybe the farmers are just going to uh, march on on London every other weekend like some other people. And it'll be interesting to see what happens then because other people have been out of March absolutely every weekend. Do whatever they like. Say whatever they like. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if the farmers do that, what they start calling it. Perhaps they call it sort of far-right farming. Perhaps that's what we're headed. We're going to undermine the whole thing by calling all farmers far-right and then, and then lock them all up. And they'll have to farm, but in small patches like they did in porridge. <laughs> Yeah, this is a thing now, isn't it? You have the truckers in Canada, you have the farming party in Holland, and farming is a kind of, not just a metaphor, it's, it's a reality and a metaphor for populism in general and for the, the problems people are facing. And it's funny that it's happening everywhere in the West, and you sort of go, yeah, maybe you could learn from that, you know, managerial elites that 
the people, the working class people and the people that give us our food and deliver our food and so on are re revolting around the Western world. And they, they don't seem to learn anything from that, do they? Because those are the people that have to be crushed in their revolution. So it is a war between globalism and that vision, the bug eating the bugs in your little pod vision of society versus the, the, what the farmers and the truckers represent. Yeah, it's healthy, though, isn't it, to see the farmers march like this? It's good to see people stand up. It's weird how the tables are turned. It really is weird how the tables are turned. Um, and we has anything changed since the Tories left? It's just, isn't it just a different group of people protesting uh, to yeah. the point where we're going to end up in a quagmire? A literal quagmire if it's just pig and horse shit everywhere. <laughs> Do you know what? We can end on that on that topic. We've done a lot on that, um, and, uh, and I like I like ending on a joke because the show is comedic, and always have to remember that I kind of have we have to be funny, or we don't kind of you know. There's lots of serious podcasts. You can if you really want serious takes, you can go to Alistair Campbell and Roy Stewart and get the really good predictions to the U.S. election <laughs> and things like that. But from us, you get comedy and insight, and and so it's good to do both. I, I was a very kind of partridge moment. I just kind of. I was trying to sort of remind us to be funny, but I did it live, <laughs> so it was very packed up. We could we could do banter, we could do banter, and you know banter and insight. It's it's cracking stuff. It really is. It's like okay, Nick, don't literally say it though. <laughs> You've gone full Ron Burgundy. We are laughing. We are having a good time. We will look back on this funny. Like, don't, don't spoil the moment, Ron. <laughs> um, let's get on and do. Poor old Alison Pearson, our friend Alison. So yeah, what a great and lovely person Alison is. I I don't know anyone who doesn't like her no. except of course. The left wing media. It, it, she's been so badly treated by by this story. At the same time, she's doing good work and she's she's putting out important information. So she got this visit from police, of course, Essex police. She said it was due to a non crime hate incident. There's now some doubt over whether it was or whether it was always a hate crime instead of non crime hate. Incident. They're all nonsense anyway, so I don't really care. It was a year old tweet, and she's been she's received incredible support, but she's also been attacked by some utter scoundrels in the media and it's just the latest update on this is um i already did a video on it but this is an update so one of them was this shocking article in the guardian i forget the guy's name what's the guy is it grace the guy yeah, is it's john grace right right is it grace or grace you're saying it's it's grace i, I think, think. I, it, yeah maybe i'm misremembering grace but it's he certainly doesn't have any grace that's for sure and it, he wrote this piece. It was just a disgusting hit piece on Alison Pierce. It was just kind of like bullying. The kind of thing you'd almost be ashamed to write about a woman because it's just like a disgusting kind of bullying. And um, and at the at the end, he says, this is extraordinary. He talks about Starmer's kind of avoided it. This is one fight of which he wants to stay clear. His view is that police time was better spent dealing with shoplifters and long since deleted tweets. He has a point, though it would be nice if they could deal with both. It doesn't have to be either or. Hang on. Your view is that police should deal with shoplifting, but they should also definitely deal with delete tweets deleted a year ago. What a kind of messed up position. What a sick position that is from the Guardian. You think, well, wouldn't it be nice to do both? No, it wouldn't, you idiot. Of course, it was not good to look at year-old deleted tweets as a police job. It's absolute insanity. Um, there was that. And then there's the... Do you want to talk about that one? Or should we do the Emily make this one as well? Well, we can talk about John Grace because I read that article... And he opens his article by saying, we need to talk, Alison, like the patriarchal tyrant that he is. It, I mean, how condescending, immediately condescending. So I'm reading that and I'm thinking, right, OK, that's going to appeal to the centrist dads, I suppose, who like to talk down to women. But it didn't it didn't appeal to me whatsoever. And he said, 30 years ago, Alison Pearson was an award winning TV critic. She still is, by the way, uh, for for The Independent. So we're, we're setting the scene here. Funny and sharp. Congratulations, John. I'm sure she appreciates your review. Let me guess. Um, but then she had an opinion I didn't like, and then she was evil. Exactly what happened. <laughs> uh, about as close, he said, to uh, a bleeding heart liberal or northern London bleeding heart, uh, bleeding heart liberal as you can get. What What is really naive not to point out there is Alison hasn't changed her point of view. She stayed still along with the rest of us since the 90s, and, and everything else has moved. And The Guardian have gone batshit crazy, and they're basically shitting on their own. This, do you know what? You and I and lots of other people, not just not just the people that are right leaning, you know, really go out of their way to protect people so that they can talk shit like this. Because 
and, and, and we can have our opinions about it. But I hope John, you know, continues talking shit because I, I, I respect his right to do so. What I can't handle is when it's, and we'll get to this in a minute with the rest is politics, but this sort of journalist on journalist attack as if you can't understand the importance of being able um, to make mistakes or to speak freely. Is it, what, are we, supposed to, are we supposed to think that these people are naive and that they don't understand how important that is? Of course they do. They say, all they're doing is enhancing the point of the people that believe the police are doing the right thing. And so if you believe the police are doing the right thing, essentially what you're saying is all speech must be policed, must be moderated. Which is why lots of people are going to blue sky, which has become this sort of its strapline being it's a heavily moderated social media platform. Very which heavily, they've all mad. reported each other. Have you seen the number? Well, of they are all reporting each other <laughs> in between breastfeeding, you know, or being breastfed by their mothers. I don't understand. I don't. I mean, fair play to them. Go and do what you like. I'm not going to be on blue sky. Um, it, it would be pointless. For me. I don't even think I would say anything on Blue Sky that would get me reported. But I don't want to be there because I don't want to be in this kind of nanny state play school environment where there are a list of things you can say and there are a list of things you should believe. And if you don't, you're bad. I mean, who wants to be involved in that anyway? I mean, I'm a comedian. The whole idea of me being a comedian is that I can say things uh, to be funny, outrageous things to be funny, point out the absurdity of people like John Grace and have the absurdity of the things I say pointed out too, by the way, in, in, the, name of, in the name of comedy. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Who wants to be in this sterile environment where, you know, who and who are the moderators? Who are the, you know, the great yeah. thing about X is, uh, is it, there's a lot less moderation and it means there's a lot less people with very tight opinions telling others what to believe. Who cares for that? Well, yeah, Blue Sky, I'll comment on a second. I mean, I'm a retired comedian, so I know I'm just the funniest uh, far-right demagogue in town. But um, Blue Sky, I put out an incredibly broad parody saying I'm leaving for Blue Sky, you know, because uh, I hate Elon Musk. I'm, I know, I, I, and he's dumb. I know he's like, builds rockets and is the richest man in the world and runs multiple businesses, but I'm better. Uh, and I want to be amongst people who only listen to Alistair Campbell's podcast. People took that seriously. Several people took that seriously. I'm like, there is no parody too broad that dummies on the internet won't think it's serious. It always blows my mind. But anyway, Blue Sky, yeah, all the, the, the massive reporting of each other. I just think Blue Sky is going to be people all doxing each other. Then they all leave their house to go and go to the other person's house to attack them. But they've also left to attack them. So they, they, they miss each other in the night. And it's just endless doxing and reporting. But yeah, what it, the, the, um, so the news agents, I wanted to get onto that. Their comments on um, Alison, which were just... Truly appalling. So it's Emily Maitlis sat around with John Sopel and Lewis, whatever his name is, and you're just like, oh, I mean, it's so... But I suppose like, where, I suppose this is the equivalent, I mean, a more comedic version, but they'll look at us and go, oh, these people are dumb and scumbag. You look at them, though, it's extraordinary. They, these are journalists. And if you look up the Wikipedia, Emily Maitlis is still a journalist. Some people are like, aren't they presenters? Like, No, they, they claim to be journalists. I think all of them probably... They think their job is to attack other journalists and defend abuses of power. I mean, how, how incredibly twisted is that? And there's nothing they can't justify. And at one point, Maitlis compares the police visiting a journalist for a year-old deleted tweet to a hypothetical person who's probably a bit like you, Paul, probably a gammon, saying that, oh, next they'll be saying, I won't be able to put up my Christmas tree. She goes, when you try and talk about this, everyone just calls it a police state. And then they start saying things like, oh, yeah, next... How is that in any way similar? The police visiting you for a de year-old deleted tweet, which is obviously incredibly sinister to anyone who's just using a, a modicum of common sense, and obviously not desirable at the very least. How is that similar to a hypothetical person saying, oh, next I won't be able to put up my Christmas tree? But the, the sophistry of like, they'll, they'll justify anything. I've seen people say that it's like they kind of have to justify their position by making simple things very complex because that kind of justifies their whole cast it's like oh yeah we're here to explain these to you and you, you can't have a terribly banal opinion like police obvious police oppression is bad it's like no here's why it's actually good guys it's like yeah, you're misusing your brain it's a misuse of you it's not that you're completely stupid because you have to be, have some reasonable intelligence to come up with a position that perverse paul yeah i think they play to their crowd they they play to what they think their crowd want to hear 
And the, the trouble is they don't challenge, they, they don't even use their own, they, these are obviously intelligent people, but have sat themselves in such a small echo chamber now uh, that, they, that, that they're they making points to just themselves and about 10,000 other people, and that's it. It, it. It's such a small echo chamber now that they're basically patting themselves on the back. I mean, how incredibly out of touch do you have to be as a journalist to sit there and say the police should knock on the door of another journalist for something they said and deleted over a year ago? How can you not see that that will happen to you at some point? It, it almost certainly will. The reason that they feel safe to say that is because they believe that everything they're saying is right and they're in the safe part of history. It only takes a government change, one government change, one leader change, and they're on the flip side and they'll come for them. And it'll be, it'll be left to people like you and I that would defend Emily make this is right to be a dickhead. Yeah, and, and this is where it, I'm wondering, sorry, I mean, this is where I'm thinking, I wound some people up by saying um, that Rachel Zegler, Snow White woman, who who said a horrible thing that Trump supporters should not should never know peace. I said she should go to jail. And obviously people get wound up. And I was obviously like semi trolling. But part of me thinks that, you know, we've got to go friend enemy distinction and we've just got to we've got to treat these people as they would treat us. And, and we've got to and the free speech thing is not going to work anymore. And we should just crush our enemies because that's what they would do to us. And the reason and you hinted at it there, the reason surely that they feel comfortable saying this is they identify with the regime. They don't identify as journalists holding power to account the traditional role it was a telling remark when Sopel said, you know, it's the law of the land. It's like, oh, that's that simple, is it, John? It's the law of the land, is it? As if that's, surely a journalist's job is to challenge whether the laws are just. I mean, even Lord Sumption, who I, th I think knows a touch about the law, said, you know, he said, of course, you have a legal responsibility to obey the law. That's a tautology, right? He says you have no moral obligation to yes. obey an unjust law. You can't just go, it's the law of the land, because there's been, there's been laws for anything at any time in his, you know, apartheid south africa whichever example you want to use that's the law of the land police come and visit you for old tweets yes but should it be you're a fucking journalist i know stop Absolutely. the f-bombs nick you stop the fucking f-bombs our country's falling apart <laughs> right, I'm angry with also uh, you know and i feel, I feel for him a little bit but, but but he's come out and said some ridiculous things now uh, i feel for him because he's so quick with the trigger i mean when he was talking about um hugh edwards and saying yeah, it's not really that bad only then to discover that he had the worst and most despicable kind of child, child sexual images on his hard drive and, and hasn't really come out and said anything about it since, as if to say, well, mm. you know, it's OK. Yeah, it was all about ambiguity then and waiting and seeing, wasn't it, and benefit of the doubt. Where's that for Alison? And, 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 and make lists. We always forget the guy in the middle, don't we? The little guy. Just, Lewis something. You know, oh, I'm so angry about everything, but we just don't care because he's, you know, he's, he, he's relatively insignificant like the rest of us. Make lists and so for the ones with BBC careers. And the reason that we care about them is because they, they made a lot of money and, a, and a, a very, had very successful careers uh, tricking us all that they were in, in any way impartial. Were you tricked by make lists? Yeah, I don't think anyone was tricked by it. It's like, when she came out, I was like, oh, now I can say my real views. Oh, they're the exact ones that we all knew. Lo and yeah. behold, it's kind of like when Constant came out and said, I'm, I'm finally coming off the fence. I'm pro-Israel. It's like, yes. <laughs> no well, I'll tell you what, that's no not, that's, what you were. Go on. Really interesting point, though. So over the summer during Edinburgh, there were Reginald Dean Hunter, right? Got in a lot of trouble for things he, he said on stage and things that happened with the audience member in Edinburgh. Now, I don't agree with what happened. But on headliners, I defended his right to be a comedian and say whatever he likes, okay? Because I am defending the right to be a comedian and say things that not everybody would like uh, to make people laugh as an art form, okay? So let's switch that to a few months later. And Emily Mate, this is criticizing Alison Pearson for essentially being a journalist. Oh, I, I think she'd have had much more integrity if she said, look, I'm a journalist too. I understand how people find themselves in this position and I protect her right to do so. And then go on and argue why perhaps Alison might be wrong in some way. But just to dismiss it as if um, anyone are, that has a different view doesn't have the right to speak anyway, it, you know, just as a, as a terrifying insight into how these people think. And by the way, to be very objective, as objective as possible, I mean, she, Alison did, apparently, it looks as though she made a mistake in the tweet 
and therefore deleted it. But isn't that what you would do? You delete the tweet because you make a mistake. Why then does it warrant a visit a year later? Well, she says, or her legal experts say it doesn't warrant that. I know, yeah, but it's the, it's, the, it's, it's the instinctive sympathies that are so worrying and the sophistry that will justify anything. And by the way, that Lewis thingy, to be fair to him, he, I think he did the most objective post I saw from a lefty on, on the immediate aftermath of the Trump crushing victory. He actually looked at some of the actual reasons the left had lost. So they are capable of it sometimes. I don't know if Maitlis is capable, but they are sometimes capable because they would make themselves. So, I don't even have to be objective because I'm just a sort of I say what I want. And, you know, it's fun. And I say outrageous yeah. stuff and it's funny. That's kind of what we do. But I, but I still try to be quite, objective, especially on headliners, things. I try to be very objective. I remember praising Hillary Clinton once. I mean, I will, which is my example, once I praise Hillary Clinton, but I'll try and be objective. If this, If the Labour ever does anything good, they did one thing. I said, okay, this is the one good thing they've done. I will actually praise it. I think so far they've barely done anything. But if they just took a slightly more objective view, they could be a lot more credible. I always, I'm always amazed that they don't because they could just do so much better. Well, weirdly, West Streeting seems to be the most sensible of the bunch. That and, is disturbing. And when they were before they were in power, you used to look at West Streeting with quite a lot of scepticism. Uh, but with, with regards to the NHS, he seems to be making moves that most people could support. He obviously took on board the CAS report, which literally nobody on the left did. Um, and, yeah. and, and and he's run with that. There are things to be said. And, you know, Maitlis is is an esteemed journalist in the same way Alison Pearson is. The interview with um, Prince Andrew was, was great work. You know, it, he, she exposed uh, Prince Andrew um, for us all to see. So that it's not like she hasn't got a body of work behind her that she can hold up and be proud of. And that's why I'm very surprised, genuinely surprised, when she is unable to see how how saying how criticizing a fellow journalist uh, in, for for coming out and saying that the police have knocked on my door uh, one year after a deleted tweet, and she can't she can't find it within herself. Just to say, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. How can you be comfortable with that in any way? And and by the way, whether it's a non-crime hate incident or a crime, and this goes back to the point you made about John Sopel, my point remains the same. We shouldn't be policing speech. There's very few things that we should be policing, okay? John Sopel, I saw this the other day, was speaking about this. Uh, of course, he wasn't speaking about it from my point of view, but he was saying that, oh, of course, in the in America, they got the First Amendment. It protects free speech. But you can't go into a theatre and shout fire. Now, of course you can't. And there are certain things that you shouldn't be able to do on Twitter, like maybe incite a riot or ask people to burn down a hotel or, you know, say you should go and kill someone or whatever it might be. You shouldn't be able to do any of those things. But... Do you know what? Most people would police that themselves anyway, but that isn't freedom. Of, you know, that isn't the freedom of speech we're talking about here. Freedom of speech is about opinions. Opinion isn't go and kill someone. That's a statement. That That's incitement to kill. That's incitement to riot, whatever it might be. People aren't talking about that when they talk about freedom of speech. Maybe some absolutists are. Maybe some absolute, absolutists would want people to be able to say that. You know, I'm an advocate. I don't believe in that. But 99 times out of 100, what we're talking about is people's opinions. And we don't want to hear people's opinions. So they're not going to go away. It's like vaping. It's not going away. It doesn't matter what you do with it. It doesn't matter if you say disposable vapes are illegal. You're going to be able to get hold of them. It doesn't matter if you say, now, because you were born in 2009, now you're 64, you can't get cigarettes. People are just going to get them anyway. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that you can control speech in that way. Yeah. Just a, a wider take on that. Why is it that we have all these non-crime hate in hate incidents or hate crimes? I mean, a word on a word on hate crimes. My take on hate crime is it's a, it's a unnecessary tautology in a way. If you've murdered someone, the crime is murder. It's not, and you probably did hate them if you murdered them, unless it was a mistake or a crime of passion. Well, then it might be manslaughter. But anyway, you probably pretty much didn't like them because you killed them. So I've never seen the need of it to add this hate category. And what I, my my little take on it is that particularly in a multicultural, multi-faith society, all tensions, and there'll be many, many tensions, therefore. There was an article the other day where someone was reported a, um, a vicar for a hate crime because of his beliefs on gay marriage. So everything is potential hate to another group. And if you have a multicultural yeah. society, you have constant fault lines of tension, and those tensions can be called hate. If you're on the one side and I'm on the other, I say you're hateful. And that then becomes a crime because it's, we have hate crimes. It's a completely unnecessary category. 
and it's a category that will have infinite potential to 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 proliferate because everything becomes hateful in 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 a tense society. One other point I have on it is borrowed from Warren McIntyre's The Total State, and that is that in mass democracy, you have to manufacture consent, you have to you have to manipulate people's opinions because we have voting, right? And then in a mass democracy that then has social media, you have to manage people's views and tweets and opinions on just a massive scale or every single tweet because everyone is a political actor potentially because they're a voter this is why we should get rid of democracy by the way but everyone's a potential voter and therefore everyone's a political actor and a political agent and therefore they need to have the right opinion and not just what they tweet but what they don't tweet do you remember during black lives matter it was about the black square yeah. if you didn't I didn't put the black know. Square you up. had to put it up. It wasn't just, racist. It was compelled speech. You had to actually put up the black square, not just so it was even not non-action wasn't enough. This extraordinary, and that's what I see these non-crime hate incidents as. It's an ex- absurd but inevitable attempt by the total state to police every aspect of people's discourse. So a tweet from a year ago deleted. Ah, yes, but it was a, it was wrong. It was against the regime. I notice it was. Notice it was a kind of anti-Palestine kind of vibe. Uh, Right, because the regime has decided it's pro-Palestine. And if it was the other way around, it wouldn't be a problem. You can pretty much bet because the regime has gone, oh, we use our Palestine, we're, we're Palestine. And it's a little complicated, that issue, because there's a counter elite in Trump that is, is Israel, but our elite is pro-Palestine. There's no, there's no question. So what were you going to say? Sorry. No, no, I wasn't going to say anything now. It was, it was kind of, I was making some weird agreement with some uh, involuntary sounds. Uh, <laughs> so that's what you pour big to the park. I got these rants and he just grunts. He's the yeah, people's just, gammon. Honestly, as you said that, so I didn't really have a point there. Uh, can but, I say one more thing then? Of course you on can, your yeah. other point, Emily, oh, sorry, I'm ranting. It is my own podcast. So Emily Maitlis, yes, she's done good work on Prince Andrew because, and not that I'm defending Andrew, but the, the royal family are still nominally on the other side. So she's like enemy. Even though you can say, well, Charles is woke and bloody bar, they're still nominally broadly on the other side. Kathy Newman did a good interview the other day that was pressing. I'm like, that's weird. Kathy Newman did a good interview because it was against Justin Welby. Now, as much as Welby is woke, he, and he represents the Church of England, which is still, still nominally an enemy in their mind. So they can still do good work on that side. What do you think of that theory? No, I, of course. Yeah. That's the whole point, isn't it? That underpins everything you and I are saying about this. Um, if, if, if you can go for them, eventually they'll come for you. Because because things change. We already know right now, guarantee it, put your money on, by 2029, after four or five years of this Labour government, we are going to be, uh, we're going to probably see a right-leaning populist government. Almost certainly. Because you've only got to look across Europe. You've only got to look to what happened in America just recently. It only took four years of Biden for everyone to, literally everybody, other than the black women, to go, we don't want any of that. We're, we're not going for Kamala. We're going back to Trump. We felt safer there. You know, did you feel, did you feel safe? The question someone like Farage can answer is, did you feel safer four years ago? Although he won't be able to answer that because he wasn't in charge. Uh, but, you know, do you feel safe now? He'll be able to ask that question. And a lot of people who would vote for Labour right now will be able to answer that question. No, I don't feel safe now in four or five years' time, irrespective of what anyone uh, James O'Brien, Emily Maitlis, John Sopel, what they tell you now is perfectly fine. There's nothing to worry about. They're just kicking up a fuss because they don't like Labour being government. Every single one of those people in four or five years' time, that opinion will become insignificant because people will feel unsafe in some way, whatever it might be. It might be because of farming. It might be because of illegal immigration. It might be because uh, the they watched their nan freeze to death because they didn't have enough money in the bank account to pay for the heating. It will be any one of those things and it will be an accumulative factor. And by 2028, 2029, people will be able to say, do you know what? I want change and I want people who care about us, whoever us might be. It doesn't have to be white British people. Us can just mean a collective group of people within the British Isles, those that have a shared uh, community value. So it's going to be very interesting. I think, we're, you know, that's the way we're going. And the maintenances and the soples of this world are leading us there and they don't realise. All right, brilliant. And what you've done there, Paul, perhaps unwittingly, is set up our next topic. Maybe it was wittingly. I don't want to underestimate the people's gammon. Because we're going to talk about Nigel Farage and his views on Islam. But but quite perhaps quite um, smartly, we're going to do that behind the paywall. So <laughs> what we're going to do is say goodbye to YouTube 
And then if you go to nickdixon.net, you can get the whole thing. And it's only five quid, which, you know, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how much uh, farm fertilizer you can buy with that, but it's, it's not very much these days. Not but... a lot. So five quid, nickdixon.net, and you get all my full uh, podcasts with great people like Paul and Academic Agent and Carl Benjamin and loads of other people you'll probably like. And you get all my articles. You can do chat. We have a private chat thing now where we can really get into it and say the outrageous stuff and hope people aren't screenshotting it. So nickdixon.net <laughs> for the full thing. Go there now. But just quickly, Paul, as we say goodbye to YouTube, where can people find you? Find me everywhere at Paul Cox Comedy. Come and say hello. Perfect. All right. At Paul Cox Comedy, nickdixon.net. We'll see you over there and goodbye to YouTube.